thanks so much for taking the time to do this interview. That's okay, man. It's a pleasure, actually. My first question is on July 24th, 1997, to a point where um, Dummy has been out three years. The second album hasn't been out for two months. You played a very special show in the Roseland Ballroom in New York City. Yeah. And I was wondering, what do you remember about that time and about that evening in particular? Um, lots, actually. Um, this is the first time I've talked about it for since then, actually. Well, it was it was a really hectic time, you know, because we just finished our second record um, and all that went with that and mixing and stuff. And we started talking about how we would launch the album. So we decided to do it just, I don't really know why. It was just one of those millions of conversations in a studio when we were working and in between mixing and stuff. What should we do? Okay, let's, why don't we go to New York? So I went over to New York uh, to look at three venues. One was the Roxy, which is a really cool old roller skating place that hip hop had kind of, not hip hop had started, but there was they used to put on really cool hip hop nights, so that was really a contender. And then there was the Roseland Ballroom, which I'd heard of over the years, and it looked fantastic, you know. Um, and somewhere else that I can't remember at all now, but um, we went there because it, it we were able to set up on the floor and be not be up on a stage and kind of all be together, and so with the audience around us and it was it's kind of loosely based on an old miles davis film um of him and i think it's miles ahead kind of thing um with a big horseshoe setup with the band and it was gil evans conducting arrangements and stuff and i loved that film the way that that had been filmed so that was an inspiration although it doesn't look like it you know it was just an a, an inspiration and so that's really why we did it there because we could set up on the floor and have tracks around us and all the audience around us and do it like a TV show, really. We had a guy there with headphones on and a microphone. So we had to stop the recording in the middle and change the tapes in the machine, in the um, lorry outside. We had two trucks, one for video, one for sound. And we used these giant reels um, which I just found again to get this remastered, um, which could do just over half an hour, I think. Um, and it meant we had to change the reel so he could stop us. It was like a bit like a TV show in a way. Um, I remember we were all really nervous, like fantastically nervous. We had two days of rehearsal with the orchestra. Um, we'd done a lot of rehearsal beforehand because obviously we'd never ever played these tunes before we played some of the old tunes from dummy but these were new tunes and so when we played old tunes people were really digging them and when we played new tunes they were kind of wow what's that never heard don't know that tune um and they were kind of different versions because of the orchestra um slightly um yeah it was really nerve-wracking but really ultimately very proud of what we did you know and it's great to revisit it actually 25 years later or whatever it is um ping shh, um oh god um yeah yeah as you mentioned the timing was very daring both for uh, both in in the respect that the audience didn't know the songs but also that you as you said you didn't play them live so why did you decide to do it at this point in time? I don't know. Just kind of slightly, I don't know. We just did. It was it was as a result of conversations. And um, we hadn't, the record wasn't really out by then either. Um, so it was just, I'll tell you what, it was going to be fun to do and really good and we could record it and film it as well so that was good for promotion of the album you know and it and it that rehearsals time of the new tunes and all the old ones we had to go and start rehearsing again without the orchestra idea because we actually rehearsed for you know quite like three weeks without any orchestra i think i was the only person that knew what was going to happen for, because of the arrangements ahead um so we were rehearsing without an orchestra. And then when we got to New York, so there would be big gaps, for instance, when we were rehearsing as a band. 
and I'd be saying, that's okay, there's going to be orchestra there, that will be fine, um, hopefully. <laughs> and, um, you know, we're all, we're sort of all in it together and just got on with it, you know. Um, so actually the rehearsals were only two days with the orchestra in New York, so it's a little bit nerve-wracking. There was things to finesse, things to slightly change that didn't work. Um, but what it did was set us up for the next year of touring. We did a whole tour for a year around the world, really, actually. Um, and it was quite a it was quite a crazy year in many ways. In many ways, yeah. You weren't only the musical director, but you were also responsible for the orchestral arrangements. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the the working process of 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 writing those songs into an orchestral context both the new ones and the old ones okay yeah well we first of all i didn't actually do the orchestration as such that was a guy called nick ingman who's conducting I, i'm not trained in orchestration so what i would do is write voicings ideas like chord voicings um ideas for the tunes me and jeff had meetings early on and discussed various things that we could do that would be cool and things we liked. And um, and then I just went and got on with my set part of it, which was to uh, think about how we would do that and what would work and what was necessary. Because, you, I mean, I think people do do this, but I didn't want to go to an arranger, uh, orchestrator rather, and say, yeah, just put some strings on that. Because... That's not, you know, that's what, so what do, what he, he would go, what, what do you mean? What, what strings, what, you know? So we had many, many meetings, many updates, me bringing in music paper with ideas written on them. Maybe this can, he would suggest say, well, why don't you play this on the cellos? It would be better there in their high register. It's a great sound. Uh, and we would discuss that, that sort of thing. So it was, um, that's how it worked really and he's a fantastic arranger i really 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 trusted him um he had worked with us before on a few things uh and so when we got to new york uh, all of us felt comfortable about what was going to happen and that's what i was going to say that's what i was saying that some of the things had to be changed because it didn't quite work you know um it's it's hard for me to or all of us to visualize how it will sound without actually hearing all of it, you know, um, but it was pretty close and we we're very happy with, you know, what was going on. Was it different to work on the songs from the first record, which was already been out for a while and the songs are already settled and uh, working on the new songs that haven't been out at that point? Um, if I think I'm trying to think about that because things like say glory box were already had strings you know that was part of the sample that had it had um likewise roads um had a string arrangement that we had done and recorded back in the day with dummy so it was a matter of nick interpreting what we had done and i probably found him um we didn't really have stems in those days. There wasn't like a Pro Tools stems, if you know what I mean. Um, I would have had a mix on tape just of um, just of the strings, and he would have he would have just taken it directly off there. And we would have discussed a few aspects of that. Um, things like strangers, there wasn't any strings on that, so it was a bit more. Oh, let's do some cool stuff on that, you know. Um, what else do we have from? from the sad times that was yeah because it had flute and horns on it and my friends uh came over and, and played the horns you know flute saxophone trumpet trombone um that so that was an arrangement of kind of based on the original lalo schifrin sample um so it was less complicated in many ways because some of those things already existed with the orchestra you know as did um I'm trying to think now all mine um on the second record there were quite a few that had bits of orchestral stuff on which we would just do as we did on the record 
because you just mentioned Sour Times. Um, on the new record, on the new edition, Sour Times and Roads are included in their original ballroom um, yeah. recordings. How come you left those two out in the first place? I can't remember. But Jeff and I were mixing after the end of a year of touring. And um, I think there was issues with them that I've managed to sort out this time. Um, there's some tuning issues with the guitar and stuff and the horns which nowadays with newer technology remixing stuff you can actually get into and sort out you know um so i'm pleased but we're also releasing the old uh tracks as well the one from san francisco and uh and from i think christian sands festival i can't remember um yeah, I think it was just quality control at the time, you know, because actually it was incredibly nerve wracking to do it. And I don't think we, you know, I think we played well, um, but it was the first thing we ever did for quite a few years, you know, and it was under a lot of stress. So there's a couple of things that were not quite how we wanted them to be. But in retrospect, many years later, I listened to them and go, what they sound great. What's, you know, that's cool. I saw a very interesting interview with you where you talked about joining Portishead and you said when you joined the band, um, your approach to guitar, to your own playing became a different one. You said that uh, the guitar became a functional instrument for you in that regard. Yeah. yeah. Can you can you talk a bit about that? I found that very interesting. Yeah. Well, I think that continues on, actually. And um, before, um, before I met Jeff, I was playing really straight jazz and sessions with people and all sorts of different music and guitar was my instrument i mean i was i think i was brought up in a time where the keyboard player was the keyboard player and i was a guitar player and the bass player was the bass player now i can play bass but i never would have done with an, a bass player in the band it was just it was stepping over the line now now all these years later there is a much more cross fertilization of instruments. You know, people play more than one instrument and they don't necessarily have to play it brilliantly. They, you know, because we can record and edit and, you know. Um, but for me, I was purely guitar player. I've always been interested in synthesis and I've always played bass, but um, I didn't feel like I had permission. I don't know what, it's difficult to explain that really, but. Um, so by being involved with Porter's Head, I bought a sampler uh, before I was met Jeff. I uh, know just about the time I met Jeff, because I was interested in what Public Enemy and Tribe Called Quest and all of those people were doing. It was really interesting to me. And be guitar became a functional thing, like you said. Um, and it still is. I really love guitar. I, I play guitar in many different situations but ultimately i've i feel like all my instruments that i play they are really a vehicle for a musical idea you know and and if i have to play the guitar in a different way or like with a violin bow or whatever um it's about making a sound making a world i'm not really interested in technique Although I've practiced technique for my entire life, 50 years of playing the guitar. Um, and, you know, I know all my scales and all my all my stuff, but I, I rarely use it. It's not really very interesting to me. Um, I'm much more in, interested in the musical aspect of any instrument that I play, the thing that it can contribute to the larger thing. So... I'd say it's my main instrument and I love it a lot. And I listen to great guitar players a lot of the time, but I've actually got no interest in showing you how good I am on the guitar. It's of no interest to me. Um, that's for me practicing. So that's how I think it becomes a functional instrument. Mm -hmm. And as you said, you got interested in the synthesis world and probably the... Yeah. The ever-growing world of guitar pedals that combines those two worlds has yeah. been quite yeah yeah because i used to no have no pedals you know very few well none for a long time and then very few 
I mean, I mean, what I use now is actually not dissimilar to what I used back in the day. Just the, the same kind of things. My wah-wah pedal, uh, delay pedal, some distortion, some fuzz. I still use that same thing. They're just different ones now. And I have other things that I use to try and... I've got a very... I limit my palette um, because the world is so enormous now in all worlds, you know, in whatever you want to do. I feel like it needs limiting. You could, it doesn't look like I am limited or I am minimal, but I actually am. You know, I, the the pedals I use are really not dissimilar to one of my heroes, Jimi Hendrix, what he might have had. You know, the same lineup of pedals in a way. I just use them in a different way. Um, it's quite basic, really, and uh, but I'm. I've expanded it to be mine and use found a palette within that and expanded it. It's not an enormous amount of things, you know, um, same with synthesizers. I do have a lot of synthesizers because I really like them and electronic making things, oscillators and, uh, um, but there I limit myself to palettes of what I'm doing. So it's not everything is in, in the box, you know, everything is in the, I don't play with everything. I just have like for here, I've got a profit five and four oscillators and a thing. That's it. That's what I'm working with at the moment. Otherwise it would probably be a never ending rabbit hole where you could go down and down and down into. It totally is, isn't it? You know, that's what happens. So for instance, if I'm writing film music with a friend, say, Will Gregory, we've done a few films together. Before we start, we will have a palette and we won't do, we won't go beyond that. I mean, we would if it really needs it, but it's like, no, this is the sound that we've got. And this is, you know, I've got my guitar and I have my profit and that's what we're doing, you know. Um, and we've got a guitar orchestra and a choir and that's what we're writing for. Um, otherwise, it is a rabbit hole especially these days because there is so much stuff that you can get that is does a slightly different thing to the other thing you know you just mentioned Jimi hendrix and you've often talked about that he's been a major influence for you mm. in one interview you said but you that you didn't study hendrix like note by note so i was wondering when you started playing guitar and when you built your jobs was there any player you really studied in detail and and, and try to maybe not copy but play or, yeah. or did you always yeah yeah i think it's changed over the years i mean i'm i'm interested in you know always there's something interesting going on uh in that you find new musicians and stuff um so early on I would have listened to Jimi Hendrix, but I was nowhere near good enough to be like that. And so for me, I took his spirit really. And, and I, fe I feel like he was so experimental and so forward thinking in sonically, um, not just with his pedals and his playing and how he was, but also in the studio as well. Even early albums had pan and strange phase and mix ideas that, um, were amazing and um, and then it, to me it kind of culminated in uh, Star Spangled Banner at Woodstock which I you know I just think is a most beautiful piece of guitar playing um, and it's really strange looks like it's really early in the morning um, not that many people watching um, just this amazing sonic world that and also huge political statement um, so that was a huge influence on me and i've never tried to work out what he did or anything it's not important it's really it's really about the you know the kind of commitment to sound that he had it, even when he was playing blues you know it's very different from hearing you know lightning hopkins or muddy water bb king or albert king it's not like that it's the whole other world of sonic adventure really um other guitar players i would have listened to would have been like wes montgomery um grant green a lot and then other instrumentalists like lee morgan the trumpet player clifford brown charlie parker 
John Coltrane hugely um many things over the years you know I'm a huge fan of Mark Rebo the guitar player um who I now know and have hung out with and played together actually a couple of times so his he's influenced me and the things that would have influenced him influenced me um I've always liked like I can't even think of any names actually but kind of twangy American Americano tremolo guitar like Jimmy Vaughan from the fabulous Thunderbirds I always loved his playing um um country players you know it's across the board really I loved all the wrecking crew people Tommy Tedesco Glenn Campbell all of those that played on all the records that we lo love and know like the monkeys and um you know the Beach Boys, uh, Lalo Schifrin soundtracks, endless, endless sessions that they used to do and play on. You know, the Birds, a uh, Carol K. When you speak of the uh, crew, probably, so yeah, yeah, absolutely amazing, huge influence. You know that kind of dead bass sound. That I think it's Carol K. On Sad Times actually, because that is a Lalo Schifrin sample from More Mission Impossible, and I think it might be Hal Blaine playing the drums. I don't know, but. Um, it certainly sounds like Carol Kay playing the bass. Um, yeah, so, you know, yeah, fantastic. I love all those people. When you think of Bristol in the early 90s, what comes to mind? How was your life back then? What was the creative atmosphere? Well, it's better than it is now. I think, um, I think without getting into politics, our country is going down badly and it feel, it affects all of our cities and all of our attitudes towards uh everything really and creativity was i mean i was younger then and i was more not more eager because i'm still the same but i was more there's a lot i had to learn as there is now but i felt like bristol had a um bristol had a a lot going on and it was really inspirational for me and uh there was a lot of music that we wouldn't know about you know that didn't make it out into the world particularly um and lots that did you know like massive attack um tricky La later ronnie size and all of those people um and earlier on the pop group and there was a lot of lot of good music happening in bristol at that time there is now but i'm less connected to it i'm I'm my mind is in a different world now and um it it was a very creative city at that time was there a camaraderie between the musicians and the bands did you feel yeah. each other yeah 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 we never really we people used to keep themselves to themselves quite a lot and just get on with doing their own music but we all knew each other and we were all friends, you know. It's really nice. I, li I like it. I saw Mushroom from Massive Attack the other day um, and it was just really nice to see him. I hadn't seen him for quite a few years, you know, because he's not part of the band anymore. And um, it's just really lovely to see him. And I remember those back in the day, that time when, you know, we were all doing our music in Bristol. And, um, yeah, I do. I feel a kind of kinship with... I'm not from the city. I moved here in the 80s, and uh, so it's not my hometown, but I, it is now. And, and all of this history, I think, is um, is important to me. Mm -hmm. The optimistic attitude towards music making at that time, the new world that it seemed like we were all kind of going towards, you know, the amalgamation of people from different genres to make music um our proximity to glastonbury festival as well was also really important because there's always a quite a lot of bristol people at the glastonbury festival which I th is a great festival you know and um there's always like a flurry of activity in bristol before glastonbury and then the whole of bristol empties and goes to <laughs> glastonbury and um loads of bands from here play there and it's really nice i like it 
coming from the past to the future, which is my last question. Um, can you talk a bit about um, the future of Portishead? That's difficult to talk about. And I knew you would ask me that. And um, I actually haven't got any answers for you at all. We're all doing different things. You know, Beth is now promoting her own record. She's on tour this year. Um, and Jeff is working on his stuff, Beak. And I'm working on a few things that will become apparent at some point this year, later this year. Um, so we're all kind of disparate, really. And um, I seem to be the currently the um, curator of our archive. So um, that's where we're at at the moment. And what are you working on other than that? Is there any new projects of yours coming out? Uh, yeah, there's um, there's something really fantastic singer that I've been working with later in this year. Uh, we will hear that, I hope, and that's cool. Um, what am I working on? Loads of things, all sorts of stuff. And uh, I have a record, a free improv jazz record happening soon, um, probably May time. We will have that out, uh, May, May, June. Um, and just preparing many things for the later part of this year some more porter's head stuff archive stuff um yeah every day is filled with something that's fantastic yeah then thanks so much for taking the time it's been really interesting talking to you oh thanks man that's cool <laughs>